Okay, well, we'll we will make a start now. Um, unfortunately, Patrick has had to momentarily absent us because um, a fire alarm has gone off, but he assures us he'll be back soon. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm zooming to you from the unceded country of the Lunalaw people, and I'd like to pay my respects to them and their elders. Um, I'd also like to particularly welcome any First Nations people joining us today. Um, my name is Laura Rademacher. I'm Deputy Director of the uh, Research Centre for Deep History. Uh, that's uh, co-hosting this today with the Centre for Environmental History. And we have a stellar lineup of Professor Lynette Russell and uh, Professor Patrick Nunn and uh, Dr. Ruth Morgan. I will begin with Lynette. Uh, Lynette is an ARC Laureate Professor at Monash University. Uh, her interests stretch across the 16th to the 20th centuries uh, from Aboriginal people in the maritime industry, uh, the Gunitjmara and Wurundjeri people of Victoria of the last thousand years of encounter history. She's currently looking at Dutch, Spanish and Portuguese and Macassan encounters and contacts. Uh, she's Director of the Monash Indigenous Studies Centre, uh, which is a research and teaching unit specialising in history, archaeology and anthropology. Uh, she has a huge publication record, uh, author and editor of 12 books uh, specialising in Aboriginal and encounter history. Uh, she's also Deputy Director of the ARC Centre for Excellence for Australian Biodiversity and Heritage. Uh, so thank you, Lynette. I'll take it away. Thank you very much, Laura. I will flick over to share my screen so that you will be able to see my... I'm assuming you are now seeing that. Okay, Laura, can you nod if you can see my... Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much for the invitation to talk today about one of my favourite topics, the ocean. Uh, I was particularly sold when Ruth started the started the conversation with our on our blue planet uh, something i might return to at the end <clears throat> as ever i begin by acknowledging that we meet and i indeed write and live on the unceded lands of the kulin people of nam which we now know as melbourne but i'm going to just beg your indulgence for a moment and ask for a slightly more detailed acknowledgement <clears throat> so in, i'm asking you to imagine that here, beneath the kilometres of coaxial cable and the inadequate NBN, tonnes of concrete, mountains of steel, every footfall that we take is on Aboriginal land. Where once there were dreaming tracks, today we have tram tracks, bike lanes, walking paths, roads and beneath buildings sits Aboriginal land. Where we Aboriginal people have lived for tens of thousands of years since time immemorial, perhaps 3,000 generations, mother to son, father to daughter, they, we, thrived, lived, survived. Born here, died here, buried here, practiced ceremonies here, hunted, fished and gathered here, built their homes here. They told stories of the night sky, the seasons, the changes over time and the yearly events. They, they traded high quality quarried stone across great distances. They wove baskets and eel traps and decorated magnificent possum skin cloaks with ochre designs, which told the story of an owner's life. Cloaks that became a burial shroud. They saw drought and floods and practiced fire stick farming. They cared for and managed their landscape and ensuring that they benefited from its bounty. They watched the sea level rise and fall and, created, and create Port Phillip Bay. They saw the Birrarung or the Yarra River flood and retreat. And where it once wound its way across the plains, it is now a shipping channel. And through all of this, the countless generations and thousands of stories maintained their connection to country. A country, a connection that has never been broken. It has been surely tested at times, but never broken. And it is to those answers who I am now acknowledging, who I respect and who I am guided by, and whom I try to listen to. This is what I want you to hear when I give an acknowledgement of country. The ocean has been pivotal in my work, particularly um, I did, the work I did on the maritime industries of whaling and sealing, which culminated in the series of articles in the book, Roving Mariners. I've always been deeply affected um, by the work of Greg Denning and his experiential approach to doing history. As a result, I spent a great deal of time on ships hunting whales, though not with a harpoon. Sperm whales, you really have to see them to believe them. Sulphur bottoms or blue whales, it's simply impossible to comprehend not from a rendered skeleton that hovers above us, suspended by steel wire in the countless museum halls, 
The closest I've ever come to comprehending it outside of the ocean was at a whale exhibition at Te Papa Museum in Wellington, where I watched children crawl over a life-size model of a blue whale's heart. It's the size of a Volkswagen, with an aorta large enough for a child to walk through. What I want to talk today is about the ways in which my paradigms have shifted over the years. Now, why is that not, is that moving? No, it's not moving. Okay. Right. <laughs> Over 25 years ago, I went whale watching at Harvey Bay. It was a sparkling ocean, warm sun and an extraordinary sight, breaching whales, lobtailing humpbacks, leaving an oil fingerprint as they descended back under the water. It was simply thrilling. As someone who suffers seasickness, even on a pier, I'd have to say, I had to sit outside. The ocean spray and the whale exhalations were felt and smelled. It was an extraordinary day. As we headed back, it had been a very long day as there had been so many whales to see and both boat operator and tourists were reluctant to leave. As the inky darkness fell, the sea palpably changed. It became ominous, it felt threatening. In my head, I developed an earworm, John Williams' music, the alternating pattern of the two notes, E and F, or is that F and F sharp? The unmistakable sound of the theme from Jaws. It's played on a tuba, but it's just as threatening on the cello that for some reason I could hear. In that moment, I began to understand the importance of perspectives, or to refer to Jaws again, it's only an island when you look at it from the water, says Chief Brody, with thanks to Leonie Stevens. When I was working on Roving Mariners, I turned to Moby Dick, to Taipei, to Omu, to Redburn, White Jacket and Billy, Billy Rudd. Bud, sorry, Billy Bud. All the wonderful whaling books of Herman Melville. A great deal of what we know about the whaling in the 19th century is traced to the whaling novels of Melville. Through his writing, I came to appreciate the polyglot and checkerboard crews of the African, Lascar, Pacific Islander, Aboriginal Australian, Native American, Native Canadian, Native Hawaiian, and American and British sailors. Through Melville, I came to understand that the sea was not a barrier to be crossed, but rather, as he wrote, all the watery regions around is much like some noted four corners of a great highway, where you meet more travellers than in any other place. Consideration of perspective, thinking about the ocean and the shift in paradigms, I believe has the potential to enable us to develop understandings about the past that are as profound and deep as the Mariana Trench. The sea, the ocean, is a vehicle. It can facilitate movement, but for some people, it's also home, be it temporary, or in the case of the so-called sea gypsies, the Samabhajya, it's their actual home. My next paradigmatic shift came when I read, I shouldn't say read, I consumed Daniel Richter's Facing East from Indian Country. I devoured this book, greedily gobbled up every morsel and I returned to it often. Richter challenged us to see the European arrival in America, not from the deck of a boat, but instead to compose our historical imaginings so that we might for a moment be standing on the beach looking out to sea. In a similar way, Inga Clendenin observed of the East Coast first contact, where initially the Eora and the British were both cautious but friendly, where they sang and began to dance. But misunderstandings abounded and tensions rose, despite the governor's attempts to reach out to the Indigenous people with no shared language and little of import to, being, to be conveyed. Clendenin looks at that particular event with a real eye for detail. Then later when the governor is injured with a spear thrown at him, she doesn't simply accept the British interpretation that the Eora man had thrown the spear in panic. Instead, she says that this explanation leaves far too much of the incident unexplained. Instead, she suggests that the Eora had performed a ritual to humble a person who had hurt them without destroying their larger alliance with him. What she says basically is, the Eora were fully rational people with their own frame of reference and their own actions 
they cannot be seen as anything like being thoughtless. This understanding of people as fully rational but different became a lens for me to understand the cross-cultural engagements that I've dedicated my life to. The next of my shifting paradigms is changing the centre. Much of my work has been framed by a desire to decenter and undermine the importance of Europe and especially Britain as a hegemonic entity by focusing on a range of experiences that have taken place on the ocean. The capacity to understand and engage with the period I was examining, the 19th century in this case, and the industries that were within them and the relationships that emerged out of them, I argued was ham hampered by limited epistemological categories. When contemplating travel across the Southern Oceans, the usual manner in which such a map is drawn involves a flat map to the north, the top, to the south, the bottom. On such a map, the distance from, for example, Australia and say New Bedford in, the, in North America, as an example, looks vast. A map drawn from the perspective of the Southern Ocean, in which Antarctica is centrally located, in, however, enables the epistemological shift, which is probably much closer to the way in which people who lived on the sea would have seen it. I've been deeply affected by my engagement with the work of Ian McNiven, obviously, um, personal engagement as well, but I've been deeply influenced by the work that Ian's undertaken on saltwater people and their engagement, both spiritual, ritual and economic with the sea. When I start to think about the peopling of Sahul, or the Australian landmass as it was, I'm very much drawn to the idea that we've been utterly land centric. My feeling is that people who lived on the sea probably had a much better understanding of how to engage with the sea than the rest of us. More recently, these paradigmatic shifts and relocation of my perspectives has led me to develop the Global Encounters Laureate Program, which uh, we began almost identically to the same day that we were put into lockdown for COVID-19. The Global Encounters Program has three main aims. The first, well, the, these are not necessarily in any particular order. They just seem to make sense to put them in this order for the talk. The first one is an outside looking in stream, which we look at outsider records for Australian encounters. We're looking at the European empires, Northern and Southeastern Asian commercial interests, Melanesian mariners. We'll be using um, European records from the Dutch, the French, the Spanish, possibly the Portuguese, alongside Macassan and Chinese maritime economic networks. The project's asking what sort of interactions took place and how were these recorded? What role did Australia play in the history of globalisation? The next theme that the, the project covers is the role of Terra Australis. That mythical place, the ancient imaginary and its iterations upon which the Australian, or rather the British settler colonial deployment of the Terry Malik concept Finally, and by no means least, there's an inside looking out stream. This is intended to reorient our understandings of Australian history by exploring First Nations textual records for encounters with outsiders. The project examines Indigenous knowledge traditions from mainland Australia and from Tasmania and Torres Strait, all engaged with people arriving from the sea and asking for a broad time change, time frame changes and contextualizing narratives. Global Encounters has a multilingual and multidisciplinary team. We're all working in an intellectual space using traditional and non-traditional archives in the reconstruction of context and complexity of encounter. Some of our non-traditional archives include oral traditions, linguistic evidence and loan words, rock art, botanical evidence, archaeological evidence, disease and genetic factors, and of course, the traditional archives, European archival records, which is absolutely rich in its potential with 400, over 400 years of records. <laughs> 
One of the outcomes of the project is going to be a massive cultural gateway and interactive database where each encounter is translated and recorded as a separate field. Over 150 coastal nations with diverse languages, cultures and social organisations, trade networks and economies and histories, as well as their varied climate, topography, food resources and environmental niches is all going to be included. In this, the 250th year of Cook's voyage along the East Coast, and as I said before, I'm determined to decenter the role of the of the um, the British as much as I can. But in this, the 250th year, it is timely to consider Indigenous responses to both the historical and the contemporary. On this, I strongly implore you to have a look at the Colliding Worlds exhibition at the National Museum of Australia. Here we have a contemporary engagement with Cook's narrative that is subtle and powerful. Alison Page offers a different perspective on the story of James Cook and his endeavour um, trip along the East Coast, which is just absolutely brilliant. In the remaining moments, I'd like to reflect on why I think understanding the ocean's history is so important. As Alison Bastford noted in her wonderful Terra Aqueous Histories, where she documented the shift from imperial to world, from naval to oceanic. Quote, if imperial has become world, so naval might become oceanic for the 21st century. This shift captures pressing conversations that link maritime history, world history and environmental history. One of the things I, I do want to just quickly mention on the uh, there's a, a, a wonderful place at the Maritime Exhibition on the Cook Voyage where, where people are allowed to engage with and, and respond to. I'm going to leave just these two here because I just think they're so wonderful, um, particularly the one that says, not eat turtles, which the question is asked, what do you think we could learn from the Captain Cook Voyage? As we are regularly reminded, our oceans are under threat. The Alan McCarthy Foundation predicts that by 2050, plastic in the oceans will outweigh fish. In partnership with the World Economic Forum, they suggested that the oceans will contain 937 million tonnes of practice, plastic and 895 million tonnes of fish. A couple of years back, we took a holiday on the island of Koh Yaya in Thailand. It's marketed as the most unspoiled island in Thailand. The resort and the surrounds are stunning, but a short venture to the non-tourist side of the island revealed a horrifying array of plastic rubbish, the detritus of cruise ships and other. We saw everything from disposable nappies to flip-flops and garbage bags. It was horrendous. The sea is so important to all of us. To return to Melville, he reminds us that two thirds of our fair world is covered by water. Our oceans might be the very link between the past and the present. Our blue planet reminds us of this and it's up to each and every one of us to do our bit. I was about to apologize for evangelizing in this last sentence, but I won't. History, oceanic history can reveal so much more we must learn from it. The whaling, as I began this talk with, was once the most important industry on the planet. The whales may have been saved from hunting, but now we need to save them, save the very medium in which they swim, the terra aqueous world. And I finish with this slide, probably because I think it's probably the most profound and important photograph ever taken in the history of our planet. So thank you. Well, thank you so much, Lynette, um, for such a rich paper. Um, now, fortunately, Patrick has returned, um, so we will be hearing from him now. Um, Patrick, I'm assuming you're there. Yes. Um, uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Yes. <laughs> professor Patrick Nunn is um, Professor of Geography and Co-Director of the Sustainability Research Centre at the University of the Sunshine Coast. Uh, his main research interests for the past 30 years have focused on the Pacific. He's also had a long-term interest in climate change, uh, focused initially on the Pacific Islands, but also uh, more generally now in developing countries around the Asia Pacific region. Uh, his research in climate change 
has been extended uh, with his appointment as lead author on the Small Islands chapter of the next assessment report of the IPCC, which will be completed in 2022. Uh, he's also the, the senior author of the most viewed paper in uh, Australian Geographer ever. Uh, this paper was published in 2015 and describes Aboriginal memories of coastal drowning and laid the foundation for his groundbreaking book, uh, The Edge of Memory, which came out in 2018. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Thank you very much, Ruth. Can you see the full screen? Uh, or can you see the uh, the note screen? No, we can only no. see you, Patrick, so far. Still you. Oh dear, sorry. Let me, uh, can you see the full screen of my display now? Not yet. Not yet, then let me try again. Sorry for this. No, no. So I'm sharing the screen. Yes, here it is, thank you. Wonderful. So now you can see the full screen. I'm, I'm asking, sorry. Yes, I can see Lynette nodding. <laughs> okay, look, thank you very much. And it's a great honor to be here today and uh, a great privilege to uh, uh, share the, uh, the stage, so to speak, with uh, Lynette Russell, who's an old friend and a great, uh, someone I admire greatly. Uh, and thank you to Ruth and Laura for putting all this together. So I want to talk about some of the uh, research that I've done into um, understanding Indigenous Australian memories about post-glacial sea level rise. And I want to talk in the next uh, 15 minutes or so uh, about the distribution of the stories that represent these memories, the nature of these stories, and uh, some of the implications, which really represents uh, research that I've been doing in the last uh, year or so um, <clears throat> about what these stories might mean and the lessons they might hold for the, the future. Um, obviously, I, I prepared this presentation on the lands of the Gubbi Gubbi people and uh, I'm delivering it on uh, uh, lands, at least virtually, uh, of uh, other people. But I think it's really important to, to note that this talk represents or celebrates Indigenous knowledge. It demonstrates the extraordinary longevity of uh, Indigenous knowledge uh, um, in an Australian, but also in, an other, in other Indigenous contexts, and showcases what I consider to be its contemporary relevance. So the organisation of this talk, well, um, first part is going to talk about what drowning stories are, and, and I put that in inverted commas to show that um, this is just the, the sort of the pet name that I have for uh, these stories to distinguish them from flood stories. So flood stories talk about the water rising up across the land and then receding, whereas drowning stories talk about the water rising up across the land and not, not receding or never receding. Then I'll talk about uh, where these drowning stories are found, uh, focusing of course on Australia, but also noting that there are other places in the world, particularly in Northwest Europe, particularly in peninsula India, um, where we have comparable stories. Then I'll give you a few examples of drowning stories to explain um, different aspects of the nature of these. Uh, and then I'll talk about how old these stories are and how we can put um, fairly precise uh, minimum ages uh, on these stories. And, and then finally, I'll talk about what implications of these stories appear to me to be uh, most important and recognize that other people may uh, find different uh, um, aspects of these stories to be important. So starting off with the background, um, <clears throat> this graph uh, shows the, uh, how the sea level, the ocean surface has changed over the last 150,000 years or so. 150,000 years is, is on the left, um, and it shows that during the last interglacial, uh, a similar kind of period to that which we live in today, the ocean surface actually got to about six meters above the present, uh, uh, present sea level. Uh, and then it fell in a series of steps um, down to the last ice age, and the coldest time of the last ice age was around 20,000 years ago, when the ocean surface around Australia was about 120, 125 meters lower than it is today. Um, now, people arrived uh, in the middle of that process. So around about 65, 70,000 years ago, the first people are thought to have arrived in Australia. So they arrived at the time at a time when the sea level was probably around 60 meters lower than it is today, which made the gaps between land masses uh, smaller um, and sometimes uh, easier to cross because there were islands which are now submerged that were then 
uh, emergent. So the first people got to Australia about 65,000 uh, years ago, uh, and then they lived through the um, subsequent fall of sea level, which was accompanied by a fall of temperature, um, and they survived the coldest time of the last ice age, 22 to 18,000 years ago. Um, and then they survived the very rapid f uh, rise of sea level at the, uh, the, after the end of the last ice age. And it's this very rapid or comparatively rapid rise of sea level, 120 meters in what, seven or 8,000 years, um, that I think uh, is the source of many indigenous Australian stories uh, and stories elsewhere in the world that recall coastal drowning. So if we look at Australia today uh, in the gold and then during the last ice age, um, the, the, the lighter brown shade, um, we can see that since the height of the last ice age, the coldest time of the last ice age, around about 20,000 years ago, Australia has actually shrunk um, by about 23%. So it, it's lost um, a quarter of the total land area that it occupied or had during the last ice age. So we, we live very much today in a shrunken uh, continent. So talking then about the distribution of some of these stories. This is the same map um, showing where now we have 27 groups of stories and they're mostly groups meaning that um, different versions of uh, stories referring to the same place or the same places are known from most of these, not all of them, but certainly from most of these places. So this represents um, uh, an advance, it certainly represents an increase over the 21 groups of stories that we initially published, myself and uh, uh, linguist uh, Nick Reed in 2016 uh, in the Australian Geographer, the paper that Ruth uh, alluded to. Um, so by way uh, of um, example, I'm going to talk about uh, stories from five different places. Um, so it, starting in the south uh, with uh, Kangaroo Island um, and the adjacent part of the Australian mainland, the Fleuria Peninsula, then talking about Bass Strait and Bait Bay and the Wellesley Islands, and uh, then finally Eucla uh, and the Nullarbor uh, Fringe. Um, and of course, I, I do actually have them the wrong way around. So I'm starting with the Wellesley Islands in the Gulf of Carpentaria, then coming down to the Nullarbor, then going to Kangaroo Island, then to Bass Strait, and finally to Bait Bay, um, part of uh, metropolitan Sydney. So these are just examples really to give you a flavor of the kinds of indigenous stories that we're talking about and how they might be interpreted. So we'll start with the Wellesley Islands um, in the Gulf of Carpentaria, the southern part of the Gulf of Carpentaria, principally Mornington Island, but also Bentinck and some of the other islands that you can see there in the map. And the story from Dick Ruffsey, um, one of the Lardil um, people who occupied the area uh, today, talk about how in the beginning our home islands, now called the North Wellesley, were not islands at all, but they were part of a peninsula running out uh, from the mainland. And our people say that the channels um, that were cut across the neck of this uh, peninsula were caused by Gangur, a seagull woman who dragged a big raft back and forth across the peninsula, um, severing the neck of the peninsula. So to me, this is a very clear recollection of human memories of sea level rise drowning the neck of the peninsula and transforming the peninsula into a series of islands, the islands that we see uh, there today. The second example comes from the Nullarbor coast and there are several uh, stories from different indigenous groups uh, in this area. Um, the one that I've got is from the, uh, I'm quoting here, is from the Pillar Nguru Gulu um, book, um, of Scott Kane, um, and he uh, talked about how sea level had been rising, or how stories recall sea level had been rising off what are now the cliffs at the edge of the Nullarbor, um, and that this sea level rise was causing such stress that one day, determined to act, um, the, the people poured over the Eucla escarpment. Um, the story recalls it was, it was like an army of ants pouring over the escarpment. And when they reached the sea, the shoreline, they began piling thousands of spears, presumably some kind of wooden palisade, to stop the encroaching uh, water. Um, the bundles were stacked very high and the story um, recalls that they managed to contain, they managed to stop the water um, at the base of the Nullarbor uh, cliffs. 
So, you know, again, this kind of response is not very different to the kinds of responses that we have today. Um, we want to stop the encroachment of the sea onto valuable land. So we get out there and we build structures. Um, and in some cases, the structures are very similar to those um, that are recalled in these stories. The third example comes from Kangaroo Island on the, the left, the west of this map, um, and the adjacent part of the Fleuria Peninsula. Uh, and it talks about a tall, powerful man called Gurunduru, Gurunduri, I'm sorry. He had two wives and the, the wives were running away from him uh, for, for one reason or another. Um, and they uh, ran or they were fleeing along the south coast of the Fleuria Peninsula. Uh, and when they got to the southwestern tip of the Fleuria Peninsula, they were able to cross backstairs passage through a, a combination of walking and wading. So the story appears to recall a time when it was possible to uh, walk to Kangaroo Island from the Fleuria Peninsula, um, when the sea level was low enough in what is today backstairs passage to allow that. When Gurunduri caught up, he was really angry to see his wives uh, escaping from him, so he summoned the waves to rise up and drown them, and their bodies were washed to the south and became um, what today we call the pages, uh, the islands out there that you can see. And since this time, Backstairs Passage has been submerged. Um, so this, again, is a story to me that suggests um, a time when Backstairs Passage was passable, um, was, uh, was dry land. The fourth example I've got, and this uh, represents work that uh, is still uh, in uh, development, if you like, with Dwayne Hamaker from uh, uh, the University of Melbourne. Um, and it talks about uh, Bass Strait. We know that people um, uh, were occupying Bass Strait um, without dingoes um, uh, at the time they were first recorded um, uh, formally. Uh, so it's clear that um, people moved between what is now mainland Australia and what is now offshore Tasmania uh, quite freely for much of the time that people have occupied uh, Australia. Um, but there was an end to that uh, and uh, some of the earliest um, stories um, of uh, indigenous Tasmanians talked about a time when Tasmania was settled by people from a far country. They came uh, here on land and the sea was subsequently formed. Uh, and it's of great interest to us, to, to Dwayne and I, to work out um, when this event is likely to have happened. But when it happened, um, it probably uh, drowned the last remaining route represented here by the red line um, between mainland Australia and what is now Tasmania. The fifth example comes from Bait Bay, and it represents stories uh, recorded in the 1920s. Um, and it talks about uh, an, an anonymous man. Um, he was uh, named Mister by the local people, uh, and perhaps he was one of the Gunamata uh, people. Uh, and he said that in the early days, the sea here was a lot further out, and uh, his people used to gather ochre about four kilometers seaward of Gibbon Head so roughly where the arrow uh, is pointing today. Uh, and if that was true, um, then it probably represents a time uh, in the past when people utilized uh, coastal resources this far out. And, and let me just make the point that if this was an isolated story uh, in Australia, then we might be right to dismiss it. Um, Know, as, as a fabrication or as fiction or something like that. But the fact that we have stories of this kind from now 27 places all the way around the Australian coast really um, should make us sit up and, and pay uh, good attention to this, this kind of thing. Um, sorry, something has just happened to my screen here. Okay, so ages. How, how can we determine the ages of these stories? Well, um, we know um, from scientific research, we know how the level of the ocean surface has changed around Australia within the last 13,000 years or so. Uh, and that's what's shown on this graph here. We can't be precise about where sea level was, so we represent the error um, by an envelope rather than by a single line. So the sea level envelope in blue that you see in the graph here represents the um, likely, uh, somewhere in there represents the likely level of the ocean around uh, Australia uh, 
um, at different times in the past. So if we go to the lowest point on this graph around what 13,000 uh, years ago, the sea level was about 70 meters lower than it is today. If we go up to the first broken line, the sea level was 60 meters lower than it is today, somewhere between 13,100 and 12,300 years ago, and so on and so on. What's really important to note is that the ocean surface sea level reached its present level around Australia between 7,700 and about 6,350 years ago. So around about 7,000 years ago. So any story that recalls a time when the sea level was lower must be more than 7,000 years old. With that in mind, it's possible to interrogate the stories that I've just talked about and put minimum ages on these stories. So exam for example, the story from Beit Bay about the ochre mining, that would assume within the, um, within the limits of the story, which of course is very vague, it, would, it, it allows us to assume that the sea level was between five and 20 meters lower than it is today at Beit Bay for this story to be true, which gives us a range of between 7,450 and 9,340 years ago for that story. Um, it's the same in the Wellesleys. For Kangaroo Island, the stories are about when um, Backstairs Passage was dry land would have to make that story more than 10,000 years old. The Nullarbor stories, there's a bit of uncertainty in there about what they refer to, but again, we're looking at something uh, similar. And the stories about Bass Strait, um, well, the, the work that Duane and I have been doing suggests that these stories recalling the last time that people crossed from the what is now the mainland to Tasmania, um, those stories date from about nine, sorry, 11,960, somewhere to between 12,000 to 12,890. Uh, and just to talk about uh, that, um, the approach that Dwayne Hamaker and I have taken um, in Bass Strait uh, is that um, sea level uh, records suggest that the minimum age of these stories is between 11,960 and 12,890. Um, indigenous Tasmanians also had astronomical knowledge consistent with observations of the star Canopus at a far southerly declination sometime between 16,300 and 11,800 uh, years ago. Um, so the point of our research is that the astronomical um, memories um, are uh, consistent with the dating of the uh, sea level uh, memories, which I think is a very exciting um, uh, research project. So let me just end my discussion today by talking about some of the implications of these stories. What are the main implications of all this? And I recognize that other people may have quite different takes on this. Um, but to me, uh, I think one of the most important things is what indigenous people, of course, across the world have known for a long time, is that stories containing useful or contextual knowledge can be preserved in oral traditions for more than 10,000 years. Um, 10,000 years may be um, one of the upper limits of the so-called edge of memory, but uh, I think it's fairly clear that, uh, that this is the case. Um, so not only should we be interrogating such stories for meaningful information about the past, but we should also, or can also ask, whether they contain lessons for the future. Um, and I think it's, it's fair to conclude that um, Australian indigenous cultures are the world's most enduring. Um, they show us um, today what it was once like for all of us. Um, we all, wherever we come from in the world, we all um, came from oral cultures in which knowledge was, um, huge amounts of knowledge were conserved and they were passed on from one generation to the next, often with aid memoirs like, like rock art, like dance and performance, um, like poetry, like songs, um, but uh, preliterate or oral cultures um, were no less um, information dense for being oral um, than our literate cultures are today. So I think that's a very important lesson to, to come out of this. So um, all the stories that uh, I've discussed in this presentation come from already uh, published sources and I'd like to acknowledge who I believe to be the um, owners of, or the original owners uh, of these stories, um, many of which are in my 2018 book, The Edge of Memory, 
Um, just to make it quite clear, this is not an academic book. It is a non, uh, written for a non-specialist uh, readership. So thank you all very much for listening. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Pat, uh, much Patrick. It's really incredible work that you're doing and exciting stuff. Um, we're going to move on to um, Ruth Morgan's discussion and after that there'll be a time for questions. But I'll just introduce uh, Ruth. So she's an environmental historian and historian of science uh, with particular focus on Australia, the British Empire and the Indian Ocean. She's Associate Professor in the School of History um, at ANU and also Director of the Centre for Environmental History here. She's Vice President of the International Consortium of Environmental History Organisations, Treasurer of the International Water History Association, and Vice President of the International Commission on the History of Meteorology. Uh, take it away, Ruth. Okay, thanks so much, Laura. And it's a real pleasure to be here. It's really exciting for um, our little centre, which is going through obviously um, great renewal at the moment to, to partner with uh, Laura and Anne's centre uh, for rediscovering the deep human past. It's a real uh, delight to, to hopefully forge more of a partnership over time. Um, I think there's a lot of um, uh, complementary initiatives and efforts and interests uh, between us. And it's a real pleasure to have uh, uh, the likes of Lynette Russell and Patrick Nunn sh sharing with us their, um, their thoughts. And of course, I also pay my respects to uh, the unceded lands, um, the, the elders, the past and present of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. Um, so, how to how to bring up how to bring all of this together? Um, I think what struck me um, was really kind of an element there of of connection, not only across space and across time, and it's something that I think um, perhaps historians uh, or more modern historians perhaps have been a slightly uh, slow to think think through this um, element of connection and and change over time. Um, where so often in terms of maritime history, which of course um, uh, Lynette has uh, reminded us of, is you know, often seen as just uh, histories of getting from one place to another, but not necessarily recognizing what's happened in those oceanic spaces as being important on their own terms. And also the, the ways in which the, the ocean has been mobilized and moved and configures space in its own ways, recognizing those winds and currents and tides as being you know, so central to the making of worlds, not only our bond world, but um, worlds of the past. And trying to, trying to pin those down in time is incredibly challenging, as, as Patrick showed us, the ways in which certain knowledges um, have tried to um, explain and remember and, and store the lessons of those uh, you know, incredibly dynamic histories. We, we've thankfully shifted beyond that kind of idea of stasis. And, and I think that's only natural in a world that is rapidly changing. And, and that you know, our, our appreciation of that accelerating change, I think is something that is really hopefully coming through as we conceive not only of the ways in which we, um, I think uh, it's quite interesting seeing that sea level envelope, but we're also moving out of a time of uh, what was in a planetary sense, quite stable, that Holocene envelope of stability. And as we're moving into what we might call the Anthropocene, grappling with all these changes, which for the moderns, that is quite intimidating. And to, uh, to some people, those sorts of stories, um, the memories, the, even the warnings and lessons that we can take from deep time it can be reassuring, even if in some ways that might also require something of a, a recalibration in the way in which we um, we uh, understand our relationships with um, the more than human world of how we live with the sea, how we live on and with coasts and and the creatures and and more than human beings that that live there and, and guide that kind of life. It's it's certainly challenging to a very um, I suppose polarized worldview in which only certain knowledges um, are valued. So I think there's all sorts of challenges and and really meaty things to to work with and. What I think came through in both talks, and um, it, it struck me the enormous agency that those stories are holding for us, and also the work that Lynette's doing with her amazing team of researchers, which, um, you know, clearly you need that multilingual interdisciplinary team to even attempt to do such things, um, is, is that agency, is that not just, uh, you know, complacently sitting by and watching change happen, um, to actually, you know, try and engage with that, try and learn from it. We had Patrick's um, Nullarbor peoples seeing the sea changing and trying to do something about it. So I think that's enormously compelling. And we see that too in the Pacific or in the Torres Strait, where you have 
uh, Pacific warriors saying, we're not drowning, we're fighting. And the Torres Strait Eight saying, hang on, this is a human rights issue. It's not just about questions of energy and climate, but actually our way of life and how we live here. So I think there's so many rich things for us to take away when we're looking, as, as Lynette said, beyond our shores, looking outwards, um, not necessarily in fear, but in terms of respecting this other force. So I think I've covered some of my points there. And I think one of the things that, you know, with any luck we're seeing, and I know uh, Patrick's probably been grappling with this in an IPCC sense as well, is that other knowledges are finally being recognised um, among scientists. And we're seeing even journals like Nature saying, science isn't enough for these, um, for, to galvanise action or to change people's uh, views of the world. It's, it's actually a multidisciplinary project in which we can't just listen to, to one tradition anymore. Um, that's only going to get us so far. And it's not just a question of knowing the science. It's, we've actually got to um, appreciate that there are other ways of, of understanding what is happening around us. So I might leave it there and open up to, to further discussion if we may. Thanks, Ruth. Now, um, if you have a question, uh, just raise your hand through Zoom and I'll unmute you and um, you can talk then. Or um, if you'd rather, uh, just enter a question in the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat and read out your question to the panel. So, yes, any questions? <laughs> oh, we've had one in the chat, a lengthy chat question in the chat. Uh, for Patrick. Oral, can, oral, I can't see who it is. Oh, David Nash. Oral tradition can contain meaningful information about the past, but your research shows how we use science to detect that amongst all the varied implications in oral tradition. Can you cite any bit of information where we have learnt first from an oral tradition, which has led to an amendment in scientific understanding? I uh, also, I also have asked this of uh, Joanne Harmacher, but he wasn't at the time. wasn't able to give an example at the time. I can give you a really good example, but there's not, there's not a lot, I mean, uh, I have to say. Um, I've, most of my research career has been spent in the Pacific Islands, and uh, um, there was, um, there's a volcano on the southern island of Kundavu in the Fiji group. Um, and when I first went out there about 25 years ago, um, we didn't know much about the age of the last eruption of this volcano. I mean, it's cloaked in rainforest and, um, the estimates of the age for the last eruption of this particular volcano um, was around 50,000 years ago, so long before people arrived. But then I, I was staying in the local community there and they were telling me this, uh, one, one of their traditional stories. Um, and this story was about the chief from a nearby island who every evening used to like to sit on the, on the beach and watch the sunset. Uh, and one evening he was, uh, he couldn't do so because this massive volcano, this mountain had grown up. Um, and so he got really angry and went across and started fighting the god of the mountain. Um, and uh, it, it seemed to me then to be a recollection of a volcanic eruption. But then I thought, oh, these people don't really know what they're talking about. The last eruption of this volcano was 50,000 years ago. Um, but then uh, about uh, five years after that, they, they built a new road down to the volcano, um, not for the volcano. They built a new road and they discovered um, pottery fragments in a buried soil underneath the volcanic scoria. So it was clear that there had been a volcanic eruption within human history um, of this particular volcano. So the science was clearly wrong and the science, um, if the scientists had listened, including myself, um, if we'd listened, we would have uh, been able to um, modify our uh, understanding of the volcanic history of this particular volcano um, from the oral traditions. So yes, there are a few examples um, and that's, uh, that's a really good one. Thanks Patrick. Now there's lots of, lots of um, compliments in the chat, people saying thank you in the chat, but we do have a, um, a question from Billy Griffiths. So you should be unmuted now, Billy. Hello. Um, So uh, it's saying ask to unmute. That might require Julie to unmute him. Hello. Oh yes, you're there. You are unmuted. Good. Uh, wonderful thing. <laughs> Thank you both for, for fascinating um, talks. I've got a question for each of you, um, but I might uh, ask Patrick first. Um, 
because uh, it builds on, on your last response. Um, so geologists have, Western geologists have infer, inferred and continue to, continue to infer past uh, geomorphological events, including sea level change by reading landscapes and referring to proxies. And, and this is what allows them to identify things like ancient sea forts in the central deserts. Um, my question is, how do you accommodate such inferential knowledge in your research of oral memory? So how do you go about differentiating between a memory of sea level rise and a conclusion drawn from intimate knowledge of sea country, the observation and deduction of saltwater peoples who know and care for that country, dive often to great depths in that, in that sea country, and uh, for whom the boundaries between land and sea are often blurred? Gosh, Billy, that, that's, a, that's an enormous question. Uh, and I don't know that I have a very satisfactory answer for you. I think conventional scientists, and I was trained as a conventional scientist, a geoscientist, I think conventional scientists have lost out an awful lot by not even trying to listen to the messages in indigenous stories from all over the world. And I think that the tide is turning um, I, I always point to the 2005 International Geological Congress where um, against the better instincts of the organizers they had a session on myth and geology and it I presented in it and it was one of the best attended sessions in the whole of that Congress in Florence in Italy um, you know there were hundreds of people in the room and you know hundred more hundreds more sort of trying to get in at the, at the back people were very, very keen to learn about the links between what was then thought of as myth um, and, uh, and geology. Uh, and, you know, we had papers that discussed the, the Delphi Oracle and the Loch Ness Monster. And I was discussing island traditions in the Pacific of islands having vanished. Um, and I don't think there was anything there on, on indigenous Australian uh, stories. Um, but the point here is that the tide is turning and I think we're starting to take um, scientists are starting to uh, realize that there are other sciences rather than western science that can provide insights and answers about the past and i have a phd student at the moment lee franks who's working on um, with the gugu badun people uh, in northern queensland uh, on the kinrara site and kinrara was a volcano that erupted about seven thousand years ago um, and science has not been able to tell us very much about that volcanic eruption. But the Gugubadun have stories about a witch doctor making a big pit in the ground um, and stirring up the sand so that it moved out across the landscape so people couldn't see where they were going and they became asphyxiated and, and things like that. Um, they have stories about how the river, the watercourses, uh, um, caught fire, which is a clear uh, memory of, of uh, lava coming out of that volcano. So the amount of ancillary detail that the Gugu Badun stories provide to the geological narrative there is, is absolutely astonishing. Um, I, I think we're only at the start of, uh, you know, probably several decades of, uh, of um, really realizing and admiring the insights that indigenous stories can provide. So again, apologies for the very long uh, answer there, but uh, it's a topic that excites me a lot. Ruth, can I, can I just um, add something to Billy's comment there? Because I, Billy, that's a, a, it's a great question and it's one that I've pondered a great deal too, um, particularly uh, around the story of the Birrung, the Birrung Ma, the, the Yarra River, where Jellybrand stands on the hill and points out that the, the river used to run out across a plain, which of course is now Port Phillip Bay. And it's often, I've often thought, is this a memory or is this a reading of the landscape that is connected to his own intimate geomorphological understanding of the land in which he lives. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to get to the bottom of that just yet, but I certainly think we should be keeping both in mind. I, I might just jump in there. I, I wonder if um, thinking about um, what is an archive and how do landscapes speak and landscape is a mnemonic device and alive um, in many ways, whether, whether we need to have a um, a hard and fast binary between the two, whether actually memories and knowledge of country are, are entangled. Um, oh, they're, iter they're iterative, yeah, and I think that's that's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Billy, did you have another question? 
I did indeed. And, uh, and thank you for those, those very um, generous responses. I think it is a very exciting project. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how this, this question um, continues over the decades to come. Um, Lynette, uh, there is a wonderful map uh, by William Bradley that I'm sure you're familiar with. It's the first he ever drew of Sydney Cove and dated to um, March 1788. Uh, and it depicts this um, beautiful high ridges and steep slopes and, and, and the tank stream valley um, as if they were completely two dimensional. The whole map is completely two dimensional, except the harbour, the waters are just littered with these very, with numbers, which are depth soundings um, of, uh, uh, of every single part of every cove and including kind of depth soundings around the, uh, the boats and the ships and uh, down to the anchor and where the anchor is and where the, the rigging is. Um, it's a, a, a wonderful illustration of the maritime visions that you elucidate in, um, in Roving Mariners. And so to take us back to Denning Beach, um, it seems that the people on either sides of that place of cross-cultural encounter were in very different ways, sea people. Um, my question is, and it's another big one, um, how do you think these very different visions of the seas brought from either side of the encounters shape, shaped those encounters? It's a, that is a very big question. I, I'm not sure I do know how they shaped the encounters, but I do think I'm beginning to appreciate the difference in how people lived on and with the sea. And I think we've been far too land focused which is which is precisely what I was getting at when I was talking about the idea of island hopping to to Sahul, that we've been too focused on the island. And I think there's some work that could be done with contemporary um, coastal peoples who are continuing to essentially live on and with the sea. In terms of, I don't think we can, one of the reasons I, I show that circumpolar map in a sense, the, sorry, the, the, you know, the great circle map is precisely because my belief, my very strong belief is that, that people who, the mariners who lived on the sea for much of their lives would have seen the world differently to the way we see it. And I think that's a, a crucial aspect to, to this, to any encounter that takes place on the coast. People are coming with their own understandings of the sea and we may not yet have the language to make these somehow commensurable but I think it's an incredibly exciting chance for us to start thinking deeply about this, deeply about how we have, how we can appreciate the knowledge that each group has. So I don't really think I'm answering your question, Billy, sorry, because I think it's, it's more than I have the knowledge for just yet. And actually just jumping off that, we have a question from, we've got two questions from the chat and one is uh, specifically about knowledges. Uh, so Tiffany Shellam writes, uh, following Ruth's statement about different knowledges, I wonder when the time will come when people listen to indigenous knowledges before stories are vindicated by science. I really enjoyed both presentations. I wonder how historians can work more with scientists and First Nations, uh, sorry, knowledge holders to find a way to balance the vast, deep, rich histories with more intimate micro histories. Deep histories of sea level and climate change are radically important, and so too are more recent accounts of ecological change, fish habitats, habitats, for example. Uh, how can this more contemporary historical knowledge be brought into conversation with both deep histories and contemporary scientific understandings? Well, sorry, there's a lot in there. Um, can I just, I'll just say, um, I, I, I think the work that Ian's, Ian and a colleague of his, Garrett Hitchcock, Ian McNevin, sorry, and Garrett Hitchcock have been doing in the Torres Straits, where they're identifying, I mean, just astonishing levels of knowledge about sea creatures, fish and the like, and their habitats. And this is something that was identified even by Alfred Haddon, who first went there in the, you know, the late 19th century, that they had a deep understanding. And I think if we don't listen to that, we're, we're only going to compromise any response we have to climate change and everything else. We're really in trouble. So I'm, I'm all for it. I think some of the ranger programs across Northern Australia are doing precisely that. They are starting to listen to and seek out indigenous knowledges. But I don't know if this current government has an appetite for that. Could I just say something really quickly in response to Tiffany's comment? I think 
to, to really mesh indigenous and Western science, um, there needs to be a willingness on both sides to, to share. Uh, and I can tell you as a conventionally trained scientist who, who does a lot on sort of climate change research as well as geoscience, there is not a great willingness on the part of many scientists to, to do that. Um, you know, I, I think most scientists that I know um, are, um, are not willing to, to accept that there, there are other knowledges. I, I think also um, there is what I've called the arrogance of literacy. Um, the, the, the fact that, you know, if someone is not literate and can't express themselves uh, on a level in writing at the same, um, you know, in the same way that scientists uh, are accustomed to do, then the knowledge they have um, can't really be of much use. And so I think there are a lot of very fundamental barriers to overcome before uh, that ideal is, is reached. But of course, I really hope it is. Can I, can I just jump in there as well? I think um, Tiffany's point is also um, speaking to that need for local engagement, um, which often doesn't necessarily come into play in, in sort of the kind of globalizing and universalizing ways of science. And so it's a real re reorientation um, of, of practice and vision and, and the ways in which research actually happens, which, you know, as, as Tiffany Law, all of you know, it's um, and something I'm very new to is the kind of community embedding you have to do to gain trust and, and to work out shared language, whether it's, you know, with Indigenous or non-Western peoples or, or working with scientists as historians. It's, um, you know, a time which we don't always see um, necessarily um, accommodated in a lot of our research practices. Sorry, my two cents. <laughs> Actually, one thing I'll just add on that, it's, it's interesting how um, in the COVID world we're being made to think much more intensely locally um, and realising how important place is for all of our practice and all of our engagements. Um, but that's just an aside. I'll, I'll jump uh, down to, there's actually a related question um, from Chris Lemo. Uh, he says, great talk. There is a European tradition centred on the water in Scandinavia and the British Isles. Does that have anything to teach us about how to tell and learn from other sea people's stories? Uh, Patrick or Lynette? Patrick? Lynette is muted, so... Ah, oh, sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> of course I am. I think there's an enormous amount that we can learn from Scandinavian and British Isles. And certainly, I mean, as coastal people, as sea people, there's similarities and, and commonalities right across the planet. And I think it's, you know, we really, I mean, I'm very... I'm very enthusiastic about this at the moment because um, Ian McNiven's writing a, a wonderful book on the sentient sea, which is actually looking at these kind of interactions across the entire planet and um, eagerly anticipated on my part, and certainly, uh, yes, we've got lots to, to uh, learn from that. Could I just say something very quickly on that? Um, I think one of the key things that, that I've, I've learned is that particularly in Northwest Europe and in Peninsula India and in Australia, there are very, very similar stories um, you know, different visibility, but very similar stories recalling uh, post-glacial sea level rise and the effects that it had on coastal peoples and coastal settlements and things like that. And one of the themes that comes out in all these regions is one of trauma, I guess, one of people um, being extremely inconvenienced by this rise of sea level. Um, and wanting to do something about it, you know, and, and whether it's the sort of the, the, the stories that you find in Cardigan Bay in Wales, or whether it's the stories that you find, uh, you know, in Gujarat in, in India, or whether it's the stories you find off the Nullarbor, um, you know, they, they have this consistent theme. So I think that there's an awful lot of learning uh, yet to, to come um, from comparing uh, across the world. I see, Laura, that there's a question from Sam Robbins. Yes, I was just going to loop back to it. Um, Chris is, but I'll, yeah, I'll read Sam's talk, uh, question now. Uh, so to whoever would like to take this question, are we really doing oceanic history when we stand on the shoreline and look out to the ocean? Do we not need to look further offshore, perhaps even to look back at the history, uh, sorry, back at the land from the sea? Or is oceanic history actually land bound? Well, my argument would be absolutely not. <laughs> and I think we must get on to ships and we must actually look at the sea from, sorry, from the sh shore from the ship and the ship from the shore. Um, that, and that's precisely the sort of work that I've always tried to do and try to think of the, the vessel on the ocean, be it a canoe or a, a, a big sailing ship, 
as a site, um, a mobile site that is moving through the medium of the ocean. So yes, I totally think that it needs to be uh, both. Just looking out to sea isn't on enough. Completely agree. Any further questions? Just um, raise, oh, here's we've got another one from Tiffany. Uh, she says, interesting point about trauma, Patrick. Uh, Nunga creative writer Cassie Lynch is writing her PhD about the knitting, cold times in Nunga, uh, tracking her ancestors' survival, not just from colonization and dispossession, but also epic climate change, as she reflects salt water crept over Nunga country. Um, Fascinating. Yeah. Uh, oh, we've got, a, we've got a question from Julie. Okay, Hello, Anne McGrath here. Um, I'm posing as Julie Rickwood today. Uh, yeah, my question, or thank you for wonderful papers. I just thoroughly enjoyed those. And uh, to me, it's really exciting that a historian is speaking to a scientist and a scientist is speaking so powerfully to the um, stories and the relevance of ancient memory narratives to history. Um, so my question is, uh, are we still being a bit too binary talking about shoreline? Because don't rivers go out to the oceans and isn't there a connectedness between salt water and fresh water um, and thinking of water more generally and then even thinking of the connectedness of the human body to water and the huge amount of water that we have walking around our bodies. Do you know, so I suppose that, that question is speaking a little bit to Ruth's earlier point of interest in mm -hmm. the non-human and a breaking down all, all sorts of boundaries, including shorelines. Yes, Anne, I, I completely agree. I think there's, we, we, need to, we need to really fragment the way we think about the sea. Um, if you take, for example, uh, Vanuatu, um, where the Spanish arrived, um, you know, Espiritu Santo, they pulled into a river. And that's, that's, where, the, that's where they actually unloaded their ship. It was the river, not not the, not the sea. So rivers are incredibly important. I mean, maybe I could just add something to that, not specifically on, on Anne's point, but, you know, in the Pacific Islands, um, when we think about the earliest human settlement, we're thinking about the earliest land settlements. Um, and archaeologists, God bless them, uh, archaeologists, uh, particularly the ANU archaeologists, uh, hi there. Um, uh, they they tend to look. When was the first settlement on this island, and when was it the first settlement on the next island? They're missing out a huge amount of history, which the people talk about all the time. Um, and I'm actually convinced that the first settlers of many Pacific island groups uh, were in fact sea gypsies, if you like to call them, or, or people who effectively lived on their boats uh, most of the time. Um, and I think that we've been guilty in the Pacific, or archaeologists have been guilty uh, in the Pacific, of superimposing their 20th century and 21st century norms on a situation three or four millennia ago uh, and saying, well, obviously people um, got on a boat to go from one island to another. Uh, I don't think they did. I, I think we need to um, revisit um, our, our worldviews when we're trying to interpret the past. I completely agree with that. I'm, and, and certainly the early, um, the early connections across Northern Australia, which became the Macassans, uh, are almost certainly not Macassans, but in fact, sea gypsies um, coming across, who are people who are highly mobile, um, but they, are live, they live on this, on their vessels. We've got a, a related question from Josh Newham. Uh, he says, um, I've been reading Rachel Carson's The Edge of the Sea, and I wonder how today's panel conceptualise the shifting nature of tidal zones that Carson describes when thinking in the context of deep time. What does it mean for humanity in the present, the Anthropocene, to really understand that sea levels have changed and shifted in the past and are shifting again now? How does our understanding of the boundaries between the ocean and the land need to change? So a related question, but also moving into questions of the Anthropocene and climate change. That's a good question. Um, in terms of how we, what does it mean? I mean, it, it, in, in lots of ways, it can be utterly banal. I mean, yes, the continent used to be bigger, the, and now we find some archaeological sites that are under the water. What does that mean? We know the continent used to be bigger. So to me, there are, the, unless we theorise this really carefully and we just make a really 
you know, nuanced attempt to understand what this means in the lives of the people living by the coast in on the on that shifting landscape on that continent growing and, and shrinking, then I don't think we're doing it particularly good work. I think we really need to move beyond the, you know, the continent used to be bigger and now there are some sites that we found which to me has a kind of like so what factor. And look, if I could just add to that, um, you know, I'm criticizing everyone today, but, you know, I think historians, uh, most historians in the past have been guilty of thinking of the history of humanity as the history of humanity on the land they can see today, rather than the history of humanity on the land that's today uh, mm -hmm. underwater. You know, and I think all over the world, um, you know, this applies. We're missing huge chunks of human history, um, which can inform our conceptions of our our models of how culture and uh, place and things like that have evolved, we're missing it all because it's, it's underwater. Uh, and again, I think the tide is, uh, is turning. I think, uh, um, you know, in the next 20 or 30 years, we'll see a lot of exciting insights into human history coming from what we're finding um, underwater, but it, it hasn't happened in the past. No, no. And in, and in fact, I, I would go as far as to say that the location of these underwater sites, be they a lithic scatter or even, who knows, a cave with rock art, who knows, it's all possible. My feeling is, unless we do more with it than just document it and say, look, gee whiz, there it is, uh, I don't think it's actually particularly, it's, it's an expensive exercise, to be honest. And I'm the last person in the world to be an economic rationalist, but part of me does actually wonder, <laughs> what is the value? Yes, the tide indeed turning, Patrick. Um, we, we've got a few other questions. Um, so one from, a comment from Karen Firewood, who says, as an historian doing maritime historical archeology, span there's an overwhelming connection between land and the medium of water in all its forms. And they are never two separate entities. Local histories, including genealogies, are so important to discover context and networks. Um, and a question from um, Helen Wozwodowski, uh, she says, uh, would either speaker like to talk about the relationship between the creation of knowledge about the ocean by the historical actors they study and ocean history? Certainly the historical actors that I have studied in the past conceived of the sea uh, not as a barrier but as a medium, as, a, as, a, as, a, as I said, Melville's highway. And I think uh, the study of the ocean is a, a, a very different thing again. There's a Emma Lee uh, Palawa. Um, woman from Tasmania has had some beautiful work uh, I read where she talked about looking at the seabed of Bass Strait and thinking this is where my ancestors used to walk this is you know it's conceptualizing it really very differently to the way I might conceptualize it and I think that's that's what we've got to do next we've got to move beyond just these two as I think someone said before these two kind of rather clunky binaries that we've got somehow shore or water it's all connected. And that's why I show the Earthrise, which is one of my favourite photographs in the world, um, and, and go back to that Carl Sagan quote, because it is, it is our pale blue dot and it is all connected. Could I just comment on, uh, on Helen's uh, question? Uh, uh, in, the, in the Pacific Islands, um, there are several places I know where islands have apparently have disappeared according to local people and they keep the memory of that disappearance alive um, with various protocols so that when you're in a boat and you're sailing across the site of the island um, you have to take off your hat you have to keep quiet and in many cases you have to to bow your head to show respect to the uh, ancestors living on the drowned land below so there are really um, tangible uh, protocols, or not tangible, but there are really real protocols associated with um, remembering um, particular e events like that involving the ocean. Any further questions or comments? I agree with Chris, who is asking, I often oh, yes. wonder what's under the Port Phillip Bay, yeah. so do I. <laughs> Okay, oh, oh, I'm sorry, we do have another question. Okay, um, Lisa Hilly uh, writes, Micronesian ocean navigators historically knew of the landmass that we call Australia. They referred to Australia in relation to the birds and their songs that traveled uh, there. 
Australia's closest island neighbours have hundreds of stories from their, from their lands, waters and skies. Have either Lynette or Patrick looked in these connecting relationships to Australian geographies? That's a major part of the Laureate program is, is to think about that. Everything, you know, right, right through Southeastern, uh, Southeast Asia, Ambon, Timor, Papua, uh, Makassar, Sulawesi, that's absolutely a major part of what we're doing. I, I don't, don't really have an original comment on that. Uh, um, I, I am aware of, of, of these stories. Um, I, one of the things that often fascinates me is that throughout the Pacific Islands, people have uh, origin myths that they came from a land called Hawaiki, um, which was somewhere in the, in the West, uh, and that Hawaiki uh, one day went underwater, and so they were displaced and, and they had to move. And some people have suggested that Hawaiki might be the uh, drowned continent of, uh, of uh, Sunda um, in Southeast Asia, for example, and the, the myths uh, originate there. Um, so yes, I, I think we should pay attention to myths when we're, we're trying to answer some of these really profound questions. Yeah, Ruth. One of my questions, and maybe it's, it's partly been uh, thrown up to me because of one of the comments from um, one of our audience members, Daisy Bailey, who's um, been speculating on the so what factor as, as we were talking about the underwater um, archeological sites. And I wonder whether there's a difference perhaps as I'm thinking through in terms of how um, these peoples of the past that were perhaps dealing with uh, this process of drowning, submergence, how they reckoned with that change um, and how more modern uh, current generations are dealing with these changes when perhaps the cause of that change is much more apparent to us that it's human cause. What, is there a difference there perhaps in how we reckon with those changes? I, my, my concern about the so what is purely that at the moment it just seems to be a kind of collection of dots on a map saying we have some sites and they're underwater. And I think it is, I think Daisy is completely correct. This is the moment to ask new questions. Mm. And while we know what's causing our sea level to rise, I would suggest that Aboriginal people probably knew what was causing their sea level to rise too. It, because we're talking about different um, intellectual traditions, mm. It, it, it would have been caused to rise by, as it was in the case of Kangaroo Island, by the two women running away from their husband. Mm. I mean, this is what caused the sea level to rise. I suppose I, just to sort of correct myself, I, I suppose I meant uh, whose responsibility or the, the, the cause for this change. I suppose it's still that kind of punishment story in a way sometimes, um, how we, um, yeah, just make sense of it, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But, but there are also Indigenous Australian stories that talk about how people responded to the rising sea level mm -hmm. and, and what they thought about it and how they feared it might drown the, the whole land. And I think that there are a few lessons in there, in those kinds of stories, um, that are relevant to us today and to, and to our future. Um, and one of those would be that the adaptation that works is not uh, top-down adaptation, it's, it's locally driven adaptation. Uh, and this is a lesson that science has only really learned in the last uh, five years or so. Um, you know, it, it's not people in Geneva who can make the best decisions for the people on the edge of the Nunnable. It's the people on the edge of the Nunnable who can make those decisions. And so that, that's, that's one thing. Um, I, I think also uh, the, the idea that um, localized uh, uh, understandings about the nature of adaptation um, should really override everything else. And again, you know, just um, localizing adaptation uh, is, is the way forward. And, and that's clearly what we, the, the message that we can find in a lot of these uh, very old stories uh, around Australia and elsewhere. I had a paper earlier this year in Environmental Humanities that talks about that. So anyone who wants a copy can just uh, email me and I'm happy to send them. I'll take you up on that. <laughs> oh, there's, sorry, is there another question from Anne? I've just unmuted. No, no. Oh no, no, there's a hand up. Never mind. Well, if there's no further questions, um, I'd just like to thank 
our two panelists and thank Ruth uh, for a really fascinating discussion and there's so many synergies across disciplines that it's, it's been really exciting and interesting. Um, and thank you everybody who participated, thank you to all the questions. Um, I've really enjoyed today, um, yeah, I found it very rich. Um, so uh, we'll be having another webinar next year and we'll keep you posted, but um, I think that's it from us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much guys, thank you. Bye everybody. Take care.